This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. Welcome back to the ZMAR Podcast. I have a special guest um, by the name of Dr. Jeff Spencer. He is a former U.S. Olympian. Now he's a coach to many degrees. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks for your time for coming on. Well, thanks uh, for the opportunity, which I appreciate this. Uh, yeah, just a lot. So by, by way of history, there's uh, three types of advisors. There's a coach that helps you in a single area of your life, like in one slice of the pie. There's a a mentor that holds your hand down the path of the promised land, a little bit more bandwidth, but challenge with uh, specialty coaches and mentors is that uh, they can help you in certain areas, but they don't know about your life as a totality, uh, which uh, the rarest of all species is what I call the corn man. It's uh, someone that's uh, uh, older, generally over 60. They've had a lot of experiences in a lot of different areas, and there's nothing that they haven't seen in life, and they look at their clients as a composite uh, of them both personally and professionally, and they help them make really good decisions that consider the uh, outcomes and the benefits to both their life, both personally and professionally, and that's what I do because of my age and my experience for my clients. I'm like the orchestra conductor that can look at all the parts and assemble them in a way that a person has the shortest path to their bigger future. Yeah, you definitely bring up some good points there because I've seen that in um, business as well as my my short stint of sports. You've definitely dived deeper in the sports end. But I think I either read or I heard on a video that you had mentioned that you have 300,000 hours in uh, high performance space. Is that correct? Yeah, and also, uh, just for clarification, all my work is in the entrepreneurial business space. I don't really work with athletes. I mean, if an athlete wants to win a gold medal, I can help them do that, which I already have. But all my work is really in the business world. Yeah, I mean, and actually, the 300,000 hours uh, was only put so people would believe it. It's more like 500,000 hours that I actually have in the high-performance world over the course of my life history. So there's nothing that I haven't seen. Um, I've seen everything. Um, which is a, a really important advantage because there's no a risk of misinterpreting the context with which uh, somebody is in. They may not be able to see it, but I can. And unless we can see where a person is in their totality, then it's very hard to create a path forward. It's like a GPS. I mean, if you can't program in the location where you're starting from, because you don't know where it is or you program the wrong address, then the trajectory is off from moment zero. So that's a really important uh, feature that I bring to my clients. I tell you, the 300,000 hours is definitely impressive across all fronts because uh, you and I probably know the author, Malcolm Gladwell, that points out that you need 10,000 hours to be really good at something and you just crush that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you bring a lot more to the table than people probably realize, um, especially when when you bring it to a level where people don't realize how many hours go into to become really good at something and then top it off. And then what I've gathered from a lot of things that I've read about you is that it's not only just doing the grit to get to that level, but it's maintaining it over a period of time and consistency and having those consistent results that you're looking for. Well, that's generally the the harder part because, um, you know, as you're climbing the ladder to, to the promised land, there's not a lot of distraction. So as you ascend higher and higher, there become more and more opportunities, more and more pressure. Uh, the world's changing, as we're currently evidencing, and we as people are changing. So there's uh, always variables there, and we as humans hope that there's a point where we can arrive and everything settles down. Well, that's not true. Actually, the higher you go, the more complicated it gets, the more information uh, and inputs that you need from informed people that can help you decide where to put your energy and what to focus on really becomes perhaps uh, the most important part at that time. Much harder to stay where you are than it, uh, than it took to be able to get there. But if you do it correctly, it actually takes less energy to hold that space because you're course correcting uh, you know, many times frequently. Uh, and that's a, a function of being able to know what to do when, and also knowing the pacing with which you should be traveling. And if those things are respected and a person understands the entirety of where you are and what you're facing, then 
that conserves a lot of energy that increases the runway to create a larger, longer, more prosperous future and memorable legacy. You were talking about some of the competition over a period of time. Do you do you see a lot of, in your work and, and everyday life, is training to get to that level, of course, in the business world of um, competing or moving to that level and climbing that ladder that you talk about to to the levels that you're looking at, is it much different today than it was 20 or 30 years ago as far as trying to climb that ladder and then staying consistency uh, consistent at the top of the ladder? Well, I think that it is. A lot of this is because of the uh, restrictions that are being put into and regulations that the government is imposing as well. You know, that by itself can be, you know, suffocating to say the least. And so there are more people vying for smaller and smaller parcels of real estate. And so the competition goes up, which means that, you know, obviously we need to be able to read the terrain correctly. We need to be proactive in making choices, the cost of a good or a bad or an action not taken has never been larger than it is today. And that's to me why perhaps the most important thing that a person has in their life, they need to make sure that what they're seeing is what it really is. And uh, that's why advisors have to be there. And the, the champion's golden rule is you do the homework and the test is easy, meaning that it, you've got to really be proactive in gathering data and information, making sure that what you think it is is what it really is, then you know, craft a, a workable plan that represents the reality and the pacing that has to go right without kind of over-preparing uh, and not having uh, too much rigidity built into the system. It's got to be really agile where, of course, corrections can happen quickly and efficiently. So now in, in some of your writings, you talk about two roadblocks that people run into. And we, we've kind of addressed the the one already where how to achieve their goals consistency, consistently, predictably, and repeatedly. Uh, can you expand on the on the second one where you know, they don't know how to tap into their greater potential. And, and can you get, expand a little bit on that and what your experience is working with your clients on it? Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why people come to me. It's like none of us can outrun our blind spots. You know, and as I said, you know, they're there whether you know that or not. And they will be the limiting factor for sure. Because, um, like, for example, you know, when I work with Lance in, in cycling, he was crooked on the bike. And, and if you're crooked on the bike and you're putting out 100% of what you got, yeah, I believe that you can't do any more for sure. But if it's 100% with the distortion, then it's not really what you're capable of until you find and remove the distortion. You can't gain access by trying harder because you can't get there because there's still friction in the system. In my opinion, again, that's why there needs to be a level of counsel that looks at the totality of what you're doing to be able to identify the hidden blocks. And again, that's a problem with the coach and mentor because they don't know everything. They only know what they know. But but unless there's someone that can look at it from 100,000 feet and see how all the parts are intersecting, then it becomes almost impossible to uh, achieve her whole potential. So again, I feel that there has to be a, an orchestra conductor that can assemble all the parts in a way that we can safely say that they're there's nothing more that we can do today, and I don't see that most people do that. I think they guess, and then when they find they're in trouble, then they start to look for solutions too late rather than proactively identifying what their blind spots are and what they should be seeing that they can't see to remove the roadblock before they get there. Totally, um, because I've seen it even in my smaller walks of life. People not only you know, just evaluating too late, but then I think a lot of people make excuses too soon, and they lower their goals or they readjust them because – it's getting so hard um, to uh, compete at that level. And without seeing that from a different lens, um, like you were saying, what you do for your clients of seeing those roadblocks or those blind spots could take it to uh, a totally different level. With that in mind, if you, you know, with the clients that you work with and they're competing on a, on a regular basis, and there's this obviously this big term that they call the daily grind. And so uh, in order to sustain long enough, what are some of the things you do with that work with clients to kind of keep the drive going? Because what I've seen, even in my line of work, as well as business owners that I've seen, they, they get to a certain peak when they're grinding it, grinding it, and they kind of start losing the drive. They can't keep the consistency and they make all these other excuses around it. So what are, what are some things that you've seen and then what, what, what are some things that have worked where they kind of keep the focus uh, to avoid burnout and making those excuses? Most important thing is to identify 
whether it's supposed to be hard or not, there are times in any goal where we should anticipate that it's going to be difficult because this is where our plan is meeting reality and plans or projections about what we perceive the effort to be in the future, but it's not reality until the plan meets the future, then we can't really say that we know for sure. And there are certain points in time where we can actually project it. We can anticipate it. And this is when we're building critical mass and we're making some adjustments and we're learning uh, and applying certain procedures that weren't considered previously because there was no reason to presume that they were required. But now we see it's different. So we have to, first off, be mindful is this too much too fast? Is that how we found ourselves there? Or is this what we should be anticipating and we need to recognize that we just need to pull the friction out of the system? And then once that's pulled out of the system, then we can believe that we can move forward uh, less impeded to get to where we want to go. Again, that's uh, an issue of pacing as it relates to looking and the timing of doing certain things. A lot of this can be prevented but generally it's because people presume things to be true when it's not, but they don't know that it's not because they're not there yet. And that's again, why I say that unless there is some mission control feature built into what we're doing while you're in the space capsule, training the dials and pulling the levers, keeping your head buried in route to the moon, there's gotta be a mission control that's looking at all the data to see the asteroid that can wipe you off the face of the earth that you don't see yet to allow you to make some course corrections to carry momentum forward to get to the destination as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And that that's what I see one of the primary blocks as being. Now, uh, in some of your writings, you talk about this uh, three-step strategy. And one of the strategies that stood out the most to me was the step three, do the one thing that has to go right. And I guess it stood out to me because sometimes I, I've, I haven't competed as long as you have. But one thing I have noticed is sometimes if you focus on the, just that, that one right thing, everything else could fall, will fall in place um, like a streamline. If you're flying a jet, it just kind of just falls into place right where it's at. And I think that's uh, an important tool when it comes to some of these executives because you know, a lot of times they get distracted so much and they're trying to work on all these goals and pull all these levers and buttons that you were just mentioning. But focusing on that, that one thing that has to go right in order to make it work, I think is super key. Well, it, it absolutely is super key because generally uh, to identify the one or two things that have to go right, what do we mean by that? Well, there, there are certain things if we look at the to-do list that are absolutely imperative that everything else is contingent upon. And if we don't deal with those one or two things, then the other things don't matter because you're not going to get to them anyhow. And that list is always changing. Once you've completed one of the one or two things, then you always reassess the list. And as it reshuffles, you may have a different order of one or two things now, which is the way that it should be. Uh, the challenge with that is, is that a lot of people mistakenly think, well, I'm changing my mind so often, I can't keep my word. Therefore, I, I'm not reliable in decision-making. And that's a, a complete lie. It, it's supposed to be agile. It's supposed to be in a continual state of refinement so that uh, we're not sticking rigidly to a plan that's now become obsolete. Um, and that's a very hard thing to trust. And you know, our human nature tells us that you got to be perfect to get to the finish line as quickly as possible. And that's, that's not true either. Perfection is like making a contingency for everything that has to go right, which just sucks a lot of time. And it's a defensive play that slows everything down. If you stay agile and you play soft offense, it's where you're always kind of reading the defense, you know, as you're uh, over the ball waiting for the snap, you're calling audibles as you go. That's what every prolific, uh, achiever or, or group always does. The, the problem is, is that if you get a real top heavy business with all sorts of the strata involved in communication, then everything, you know, slows down to a crawl. And that's what generally happens. The bigger business gets, the, the greater the risk that is. You got to maintain your agility. For sure. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I know in my small studies of peak performance in a business level, and, and you hone it down to talking about playing defense versus offense. And I, 
And I think it's key because I've seen it and I, I, it's happened to me personally where all of a sudden some people start playing not to lose versus just continuing to play the win. And it's a mental shift um, that's super hard for people to reevaluate and, like you said, be agile and just keep adjusting. Do you um, have any recommendations as far as how often should you review those and keep that fluid and, and keep it moving, uh, even if your goals are, or your, um, your focus uh, ends up changing a little bit periodically? Continuously throughout every day, that should be something that somebody has to keep track of. And, uh, you know, again, that's, uh, I would say it's a CEO function, but, you know, if the CEO's heads are in the clouds too much projecting future and they're not looking at the reality of how things are unfolding in real time, well, then there's a, a gap there that kind of needs to be looked at. But, you know, for me, it's a continuous process. And there has to be, I mean, obviously because, you know, the world's rapidly and dramatically changing. And if we don't keep up, um, the world doesn't care about what we think or what our intentions are. Don't, the process only cares about what happens. And if we don't read it quickly and we're not adjusting quick enough, then by definition, we're already going to get to left behind, which, of course, we don't want. And it you know, requires uh, this uh, hypervigilance of, awareness um, continuously to adjust. And uh, another side of that that can be difficult is uh, you can be driving your employees crazy because they think, well, I, we just had the straight, now we're changing again. Well, that's supposed to happen, you know, and, and they got to get used to it. You know, oh, God, here he is, you know, the, the boss is changing things again. Well, yeah, they, they should be doing that. And, and so there has to be an implicit understanding that agility is uh, required here. And uh, another part to this is that the mind and the body hate sameness. I mean, people think they want it easy. They want to go on automatic pilot. You know, that's really a, like sloppy and lazy. And we kind of think that we want that. Our human nature really thinks we want an easy life. But, you know, our champion's mind in, in us knows that we really want excitement. We want uh, enthusiasm. We can only get that. Uh, by being in an environment that uh, requires that we be adaptable and that we uh, continuously are, are tuning and fine-tuning the dials. Hey, gang. Ever wonder what it's like to be a small business owner? It's confusing. Weird expenses coming out of nowhere. And when you throw in health insurance, forget it. Nobody understands how that works. If you own a business, big or small, it's one of the biggest expenses you have all year long. And yet, we all wait until open enrollment at the end of the year, and then we think to ourselves, next year, next year I'll get a jump on it. And then it's another year of paying way too much. If you're a business owner, big or small, HR representative that wants to impress the boss, give Butch Zemar of Elite Benefits of America a call. Save yourself or your boss thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars a year. Reach out to Butch right now, 708 535 3006 or shoot him an email butch at elitebenefits.net and be sure to check out the zmar podcast don't wait till the last minute put butch zmar to work for you now do you you coin a word that's called go uh, gokus right yeah, it's actually it's actually a trademark word hmm. and uh yeah i have a trademark on uh gokus g-o-c-u-s and it's so funny because everybody loves to pride themselves on telling me telling me uh, how I misspell the word a typo. They love to, they love to correct me on that. Then I remind them, oh, well, that's actually a trademark word. Yeah, well, where that comes from is GOCUS stands for goal focus. The G is goal. The focus is focus. So goal focus has a unique characteristic is that it does take uh, uh, every aspect of our, our vision into consideration, meaning that hyper-focus is part of it because we need to be able to focus on what's in front of us to get stuff done to advance towards goal completion for sure. But there's another side to this, that that point of focus that we have when we're looking at something, we still have another 280 degrees of peripheral vision where we're seeing things in the periphery. And why the periphery is important is that's where revelation and insights show up that uh, will allow us to adjust to better options that are free. They're just delivered to us in the periphery. And it's also where we can see blind sides starting to form that can exterminate us and take us off the face of the map if we don't see it coming. 
And for sure, you want to avoid blind sides and you want to make adjustments to get to a bigger, better, faster. And unless we can hyper-focus to get stuff done and simultaneously be aware of better options, then you can't possibly be able to get to where you want to go. It is certainly not efficiently. Hyper-focus, shutting down better ideas and blind sides, that, that increases your risk like by a million fold. And, and if you can't hire folks to get anything done because your heads are in the clouds, well, all you do is sit there with great ideas and nothing happens. So this idea of GOCUS is extraordinarily important. It's not that none of the stuff that we're talking about that has value that comes automatically. It's not a feature of human nature. Human nature kind of is whiny, it's snivelly, it's lazy, you know, it wants everything for free. It likes to complain, you know, but, you know, that's not the, the champion's nature. And, and anything that creates value and goodness in life has to be applied to be maintained. It only uh, stays active if it's continuously applied. Otherwise, we drift back into the, you know, laziness. And that's one of the reasons why people over time uh, don't, uh, don't change. As a matter of fact, this idea of complacency, I was talking with a lead pilot uh, for the Blue Angels here recently, and it uh, came up that um, a Blue Angel pilot only gets two years as a Blue Angel, then they get kicked out. And uh, one of the points made was what uh, was, well, wait a minute, it, it, just, it takes about two years to actually know what you're doing, get familiar with it. And they said, that's correct. That's why they kick you out of it. Because when you start to get too familiar, you start to get complacent, you start to lose your edge. You're not present with the process. That's where you're going to find yourself in your plane parked into the side of a mountain. And the other four uh, pilots that are following you visually, you've taken them into the side of the mountain as well. So the idea here is that we want a level of diversity that allows us to, to stay active and, and remain an active participant in the game. Totally. And that was a great story. Uh, so speaking of champions, uh, you have a program that helps build these champions. And I was actually watching a video clip and you went through a little bit on um, this roadmap playbook. And it's quite intense. Uh, I think it's like, what, 300 and something pages. Um, you go through a lot of detail in there. Can you elaborate a little bit on on some of the uh, parts of the program that you actually walk um, some of these entrepreneurs down? Yes, I created a model called the Goal Achievement Roadmap because uh, um, I looked at the success that I had created for people in business, sports, entertainment, et cetera, and I realized that the success that they were having was not on the technical details of the business itself. You can get the coach to help you with what ink cartridge to use or what pencils you need. But as far as kind of the overall approach and organization to the business, I saw that there was a very distinct pattern that I was uh, instinctively doing that I uh, uh, codified. Um, and so there's basically two parts to the goal achievement roadmap. And uh, you have uh, the preparation side and you have the performance side. The preparation side means that you're preparing to begin the pursuit of actively pursuing the goal. And this is getting ready to start, essentially. And there's five parts to it. There's goal clarity. There's uh, having the right uh, purpose, the motivation, and the motives for doing it. There's being very clear on the impact of the achieved goal on yourself, others, the world around you, and your legacy. You have to have the champion's mind. Notice I didn't say mindset. There's lots of mindsets that are set and rigid, uh, but those are not what the champion does. The champion has a, a mind that can interpret, edit, uh, store, and apply information correctly. It's its own program, the champion's mind. Um, for sure, people have, I think, got the mindset thing wrong. And the uh, final part of preparation is resources. You got to make sure you got the time, the resources, the material supplies, the knowledge, the skills, the team, et cetera. So once you've gone through this sort of vigorous uh, preparation uh, process, then you're absolutely certain that you can trust that you're ready to start actively pursuing the goal. And that's where you then start the active pursuit of the goal. And there's like five steps between uh, starting the goal and achieving the goal. The first one is start. And you make got to be sure you don't trip out of the gate um, because you don't try to do too much too quick. Many people don't have a, a, an appropriate or 
well enough developed a starting process. Uh, the next uh, step in this is that when you have early success, make sure you don't construe that, that the goal is guaranteed. Don't start to get sloppy on your schedules and start to relax on policy and things like that. And, and generally, there's a, a period of risk there when people can overspend and over-celebrate too soon. You don't want to do that. You want to do a reality check and make sure that the processes that you have in your plans are being recalibrated to the reality now. And then there's the data grind that we talked about. You have to be very clear that there are points uh, along the way that you can estimate that will be tough. And let's make sure that you don't mistakenly talk yourself out of staying in the game when it gets tough. You've got the right metrics that you're looking at, and those things are uh, subtly improving. Then you know that you're building the critical mass that you need to develop the the true competency to get from where you are to goal complete. And uh, then the uh, next step there is to make sure that once things are up and humming and moving along, that you set for yourself a target that's not the goal itself, but it represents what's required and informs you that you are performing at a level consistently with goal achievement because once you hit that target, then you go from believing you can do it to knowing you can do it. And once that happens, it's game over. The final step is uh, finishing strong. A lot of people get close to the finish line and then they trip and they blow you know, tons of time and effort uh, and, and resources because they're in too much of a hurry to get to the finish line. And if you trip and you don't cross the finish line, then you don't win. So I've created this model that is fail safe uh, based upon my 300,000 hours about how to take a goal from inception to completion. Most people are taught that you have to have a smart goal. I think you need the right goal, not the smart goal. There's a criteria for that. Once you've got the right goal, then uh, it's not a matter of trying harder to get there. It's a matter of doing the right things in the right sequence to pull uh, friction out of the system and conserve energy and read the terrain correctly so that the team trusting you as a leader is continuously reinforced so that the team stays together as a cohesive unit to adjust and adapt and go through the predictable uh anticipated uh, experiences that they will have to get from where they are to where they want to get to. And that's what this program is, is all about. If people would like to get a, a, a quick uh, a sneak peek at it, they can go to www.beforeyouwin.com, B-E-F-O-R-E-Y-O-U-W-I-N.com. There's a video there that will take you through what the Goal Achievement Roadmap uh, is. So there you have it. This is great. You definitely need a system or what you reference as a model in order to achieve greatness in a lot of ways and coming from a guy that has the 300,000 hours in high performance space. And, and, and not only that, you're part of the U S Olympic uh, cycling team, uh, as well as, uh, several tour de France races. And I think that's just phenomenal. And if, if somebody obviously enjoys the, the content that we put on here and they want to reach out for more information, how do they get a hold of you? Well, thank you. Well, first off, uh, if you'd like kind of insights on some of the materials, success, et cetera, before you win.com for sure. But if you'd like to take it further to have a personal conversation about uh, you and your aspirations and how you might be able to more efficiently get there and uh, would like to discuss some you know, form of uh, collaboration, please go to my website, personal website, which is drjeffspencer.com. Uh, D-R, no period, D-R-J-E-F-F-S-P-E-N-C-E-R, drjeffspencer.com. Please fill out like an application, and that's not an obligation to do anything. Uh, I look at the applications, and uh, if the applications are appropriate, then I will reach out and circle back with the person. We'll schedule a phone call for us to have a conversation on how we might be able to work together. would uh, welcome any opportunity to do that. Thank you again, Butch, for the opportunity. Yeah, not a problem. This has been great, and I uh, loved uh, reading up on your story and, and a lot of things that you have done done throughout the the years of not only your own personal development to uh, success, but also working with entrepreneurs and business owners and executives to take them to the next level and compete for a long period of time. Well, thank you. You know, there's always room at the top of the best, and that's what I'm all about.